multiple readings in a single week. I must be up to something. Hmm. So the other day, I uh, read you H.P. Lovecraft's The Tomb, and in doing so, I, it was brought to you by uh, Tony McMillan's An Augmented Fourth, which is out today, and I really do think you should pick it up. It's, it's an awesome read. I'm really happy to have published it. This is wonderful rock and roll and uh, in book form, and you're going to love it. But it occurs to me in doing The Tomb, um, I should have actually used this one as uh, the, the reference book for you to uh, have, you know, pushed. Uh, Christy Demeester's Beneath, uh, because of the subterranean themes. Uh, also something you would enjoy. Also a very rockin' book. It's got a Judas Priest soundtrack. You should check it out. And if you dig the stuff I'm doing at Word Horde, both wonderful books. But I'm going to tell you about a book that I didn't publish. Uh, but I did just read, and I really enjoyed. And uh, it is decadent and strange and wonderful and uh, weird and dark and funereal and haunting. And it is this, Exemplary Departures by Gabriel Whitcop. And uh, this is a uh, translation by Annette. Live here to be back. Okay. Anybody still tuned in? So, Exemplary Departures. This is a uh, small collection of five, uh, how do they put it on the back here? Exquisitely wrought novellas depicting five exemplary deaths in various exotic locations around the globe. A gentleman spy disappears with his secrets into the Malaysian jungle. A young woman agonizes atop a ruined castle overlooking the Rhine. A writer succumbs to alcoholism in the streets of Baltimore. A salesman expires as a vagabond in the sewers of New York. And hermaphroditic twins are, uh, are assassinated in a stagecoach. Anyway, uh, she's drawing from stories and truth and legend. And I wanted to read you at least a bit of, I might do the whole thing, we'll see. We'll see if my signal holds, of uh, the Edgar Allan Poe story. And so this is... Baltimore Nights by Gabrielle Whit Whitcop. Baltimore Nights. With no overcoat and sensitive to drafts, he wore a flannel vest under his shirt and was now too warm in his tightly fitted frock coat of black woolen cloth turning green from age. He had an old military coat, but he never wore it, keeping it as a relic. His wife had died shivering under that coat, and under that coat he had laid her out on the work table between two white candles. I'm being watched, he said to himself. They're spying on me. He clutched the wicker suitcase tight against his hip as a feverish tremor rippled across his sweat-soaked skin. In Richmond, amid the smell of coal, brackish water, and heated iron, he had boarded the Eclipse, a mail-line Wilkinson steamship bound for Baltimore. It was a large paddle steamer whose deafening orchestra drowned out the vibrations and dampened the racket from the crowds packed together on three decks, a giant with iron lacework, blaring, whistling while releasing sooty clouds spangled with sparks and balls of steam rising toward the pearlescent night sky. People were stuffing themselves, drinking straight from the bottle, force-feeding their screaming children while the latrines exhaled their acrid stench. In a minuscule space in the middle of the steerage, couples were dancing, men with cigars in the corners of their mouths, women in hats, adorned with fluffy flowers. Oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. I'm off to California with my washbowl on my knee. I'm being watched. They're following me. I'm going to shave off my mustache to confound their search evermore. I created the funeral your bird so that its flight would accompany the bug, but the bird has fatally swallowed that insect. He felt faint. 
Next to him, a woodcutter clad in leather, unless he was a meat cutter, was sucking on a bottle of bourbon, and the mere smell of the alcohol filled the man in black with unspeakable revulsion. For he himself would always be exasperated with desire and horror when nearing the satanic elixir of which one mouthful was enough to inebriate him. His relationship with alcohol, with opium, with other people, and above all with his own soul and spirit, was an enslavement stigmatized by disgust, forcing him to escape, to slip out of himself. You remember it, don't you? You most certainly know it. You wouldn't not know it. He grabbed the enticing glass and, having added neither water nor lemon, gulped down its content in one mouthful without appearing to feel even the slightest pleasure, nor catching his breath before finishing off the last drop. Yes, it is very painful to recount. He could never take more than one glass from which one single mouthful was enough to send him into the most ferocious, nervous exultations, inspiring him with fascinating metaphors, scintillating images, speeches that enthralled his listeners, but he'd barely returned to the wings, so to speak. And you do remember he was the son of actors, before he again withdrew into himself, paler than an eggshell, with a fixed gauge and unhinged look on his face. Yes, that is how it was. Oh, Susanna, oh, don't you cry for me. I'm off to California with my washbowl on my knee. He got up to vomit, and the latrines were detritus, excrement, brown scum, and a sooty soup from the engines were brought back up in big hiccups by the river water chuckling and gurgling. When he got back, a, an obese woman had taken his seat, and the wicker suitcase disappeared. He knew immediately that it had not been removed by angels, but snatched by his enemies. His enemies were everywhere, hiding in every recess, every pipe, every molding of the eclipse, to then suddenly reappear in their natural size. They were, they were plebeians. They smelled of cheese. They were burdened with children in huge bags. His suitcase had vanished. Something vital and essential had been stolen, and his enemies knew very well why. It fitted perfectly into their perverse philosophical system. The paddle steamer whinnied into the wash, all its sadness over the harm people did to it. Sullen-looking trees passed by along the riverbanks. Baltimore's faint silhouette already loomed up ahead, then there were bungalows, as though painted on the backdrop of a fairground theater, docks the color of slate and dried blood, mountains of sacks and barrels, drays, horses hanging their heads toward the ground, their only way of expressing their despair. Before his admission to West Point, he had lived for a while in Baltimore and had relatives and numerous friends there nonetheless. He was not going to visit the publisher, Thomas W. White, nor John Pendleton Kennedy, who was a well-known writer and member of Congress and public prosecutor, was one of the city's most prominent personalities. He decided to see only Jim Perry's clique. Admittedly, not very lettered people, but who at least refrained from annoying him with their admonitions and tactless advice. Perry owned an ad... Uh, owned an ammunition factory and lived not far from the assembly room in a neoclassical house where he held a quasi-open table. He was a serious drinker, cynical but merry, whose infectious energy had nothing vulgar about it and whose lively intelligence enabled him to follow his interlocutor's thinking as long as he or she abstained from making any allusions to Ptolemy's mare tenebrium or any of Aristotle's axioms, for Jim Perry was no humanist. He warmly welcomed the traveler, who immediately after the initial exchange of courtesies spoke very fleetingly about a suitcase gone missing containing two manuscripts. Now, now, surely we'll find it again. I'm sending a servant straight away to the Wilkinson Shipping Company. The Eclipse, did you say? I should have paid more attention to 
a name of such ill omen, but our reason is sometimes strangely impervious to metaphysical messages. Sitting in a lounge, whose sumptuousness stunned his aesthetic principles to near nausea, he let his bothered gaze wander over the thick wall hangings, the gilded stucco frames, the fringed poofs, and the appalling ostentation of a cabinet with inlaid ivory. I am expecting a few friends for dinner, of whom you already know one or two, Perry said. And I hope their company will meet your approval or even amuse you. It'll be no fuss, you know. The guests arrived at more or less the same time as the servant who had been sent to the shipping company and who now brought back the suitcase, quite simply retrieved from under a bench. The man in black was beside himself, his civility as if swept away by a tidal wave, by some simple rage. Feverishly, he scattered onto the rug the contents of his suitcase, the trivial in indignance of his luggage. A feeling of unease ran through the gathering. Being in his altered state of mind, he took no notice but searched and rummaged with his pale hands through the shabby, disordered clothes. He was livid by now. My manuscripts have disappeared. But how? Perry asked, confused. I'm, I'm certain I, that I put them in the suitcase. Stolen. It's the second time this has happened. He grew quiet suddenly closed up the same way as he had closed the suitcase, in the same way as the circle of plots hatched against him was certainly closing up. Had he not, a few months ago in Philadelphia, spent a week looking for his suitcase, only to discover, like today, that his manuscripts had been taken from him? Had two men not followed him, wanting to kill him? And on the pretext he was drunk. Had he not been arrested when leaving the Swan Tavern in Richmond and thrown into prison for several hours? He participated in the dinner, as if from behind a veil, a shroud of agony. The black servant steadily replenished his glass. He was, in fact, totally inebriated. But as soon as we got into the fresh air, his topor gave way to a great joyfulness. What is so odd is that he did not let go of his wretched suitcase, even though Perry had offered to put him up for the night, and the place we visited wasn't exactly the kind where one brings luggage. Yes, we had decided to finish the evening at Madame Irene's. She always has something new to offer. A truly excellent house, and him, oh, him. He made strange remarks, which I'd say betrayed a certain coherence. Without us being able to follow it through, his voice was low but inexpressibly harmonious. Although he appeared extremely agitated, he was buttoned up to his chin. His hair was beautifully brushed, brushed like those who suffer from serious poverty. In any case, I have not forgotten his face. I have never seen such a wide brow and terribly disproportioned to. His eyes were, oh, how can I describe them? Morose, that's the word, but puffy from his alcohol abuse. A face which viewed from the front was fascinating, although unbalanced, but whose profile was quite frankly ugly. There was a profound disharmony in him. He spoke like a gentleman and behaved like a lunatic. It was as though he were absent from himself, vanished somehow. No, what you've told me doesn't surprise me at all. The carriages turned into a brightly lit cul-de-sac before stopping in front of a house whose ground floor was occupied by a theater agency. The lights alternated with confused shadows on the frosted windows, but only where these were not blocked by posters. Laughter and voices could be heard from the agency, while the door next to it, giving access to the floors above, was closed, guarding the silence. They rang the bell. Almost in the same instant, a black woman came to open the door, taking them into a corridor ending in a straight staircase, not very wide, and covered with purple carpet. The man started, stepping back as if he had had a shock or sensed the invisible emanation of some putrid residue. With a peculiar scream that sounded like the grating of rusty metal, he turned round, opened the door, and almost running, he disappeared into the night. Other representations of his escape exist, of him simply being put aboard the carriage of his own request, but then vanishing. Once it reached its destination, 
that is not impossible either. Oh, am I going to do this whole thing? Mm. Mm. Are you digging it? Bill Jackson says I should tell him about this thing on my shirt. This is a Lovecraft Film Festival shirt from a few years back, and uh, that'd be a deep one. <laughs> All right, I'm going to read a little more. I may not finish this. I'm not sure my voice will hold out, but uh, let's see. He set out to find a clean room he could afford. He did not want to see anyone. Clasping the handle of his suitcase, he was eager to lie down so as to quiet the painful beating of his heart because he thought the two men were uh, secret fo secretly following him. He tried to hurry and took side streets to frustrate his followers. He felt as if he were going to vomit up his own heart. Rooms to let said the burnt yellow sign, and letters traced with tar, he entered, quickly closed the door behind him, and took it as good sign that the old landlady looked at him fixedly with clear eyes, marked by minuscule pupils. Lit through a transom, the room with its pine floorboards was on the top floor. It contained a table covered with a floral patterned shawl, a jug and a bowl on a tri-legged bamboo stand, and a bed that looked clean despite the blood spots studding the whitewashed wall. No sooner was he alone than he shoved the suitcase under the bed and, having meticulously pulled off his worn-out boots, stretched out on the bed and closed his eyes. The next day, he got up and left the room in search of bourbon. In the darkness on the stairs, a man whose enormous brow and tiny mustache he could only just make out, but whose voice seemed familiar to him, reminded him that his enemies were particularly vigilant and unremitting. I urge you strongly, said the man with the dark face in a melodic whisper, giving off point, potent ethylic whiffs to change clothes right here. Let's say you give me yours and take mine instead. He too responded with a melodic and stinking whisper that he wouldn't know how. Take off your clothes in your room. Leave them at the end of the corridor. Go back into your room and wait for a moment. You will then find your new rags in the same place. <coughs> I'm going to quit there. I know, I got you hooked. And that was the point. These are wonderfully exquisite stories, wonderfully dark. They will stick with you. The translation is amazing. I, I imagine the French is even more fun, but uh, I don't read French. So I do urge you to check it out. Likewise, I urge you to check out Beneath by Christy Demeester. This is a great ride. You like it dark, you're going to love this. As You Will, An Augmented Fourth by Tony McMillan, which is out today. So uh, get yourself a copy wherever books are sold. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I hope you enjoy the little bit of uh, Baltimore Nights that I read to you. And I'll be back. <laughs>